We are living in a material world, and I am a material girl. <laughs> Today we'll be doing a video on the deformation of solids. Solids are all around you. Material is all around you. So let's take a look at it and look at how they deform. I've got a worksheet for you. I'm going to wait. Download this. It took me ages. It's organized questions. You've got the theory, which is just all you need. I've cut it all the way the fat. And it's just exactly what you need. We'll go through it in a minute. But I've got all these questions. I extracted them all and answered them all. So download it. It's in the link in the description. It's, I did it all for you. It's heaps of questions here, man. It's 45 pages long of worked examples. I answer all of them, they're all correct. So download that and I mean, you're going to know how they ask on it. <laughs> okay, as I just said, um, solids are all around us and they can deform if we apply a force to them. And there's different ways this can happen. Uh, we'll be dealing with a specific case of springs and wires, basically. And you have this thing called Hooke's Law. So this cat called Hook, and he came up with a law. <laughs> there is springs and wires, and it's basically F equals KX. So force and extension, where X is extension, they're proportional to each other, and the proportionality constant is this spring constant or force constant. Yeah, this is a pretty fundamental equation. So when you plot force against extension of a, let's say, a spring, well, it's going to be a straight line. And the area under that, line of that force extension graph we'll do an example on this so do not fear is the work done by that force and it's also equal to the elastic potential energy and so when we when we pull out a string or press a string we're extending it right and so when we do that well there's some elastic potential energy which is uh, sort of stored in the wire uh, due to its being stretched and that's equal to the area under the graph so half fx or half kx squared if you substitute in f equals kx. Okay, and but this only applies for when it's um, before it reaches its elastic limit. So there's a point, obviously, when you're if you're super strong like me, you can pull it out, and there's a point where it won't come back to its original shape. You know, I can pull out a spring where it's just completely, you know, deformed forever, and so that can happen, and that's called its elastic limit. And past that point, you know, it'll no longer return to its original shape so you know this these things apply for when uh it's within its elastic limit the region outside of the elastic limit is called the plastic limit i'm pretty sure and that's when it's <laughs> that, that that material ain't coming back to its original shape it's bent out of shape oh so that's all that and then we have these things called stress strain and young's young's modulus look and with all these things we're just saying we're just saying you know, this is a property of the material. So stress is just force per unit cross-sectional area of the material. Also known as pressure, which we went through in the last video. Strain is the extension divided by the length. These are just properties of the material. And then these two things divided by each other, stress divided by strain is called the young modulus of this material. And so these, these sort of um, quantities or properties of the material are useful. Like Young's modulus is... You know, sort of an indication of how stiff a material is. So, yeah, I mean, it's pretty... Just You just need to know those equations and those relationships and elastic potential energy. That's it. Let's uh, jump into some questions. Okay, so we have an extension. So X is extension, not length. It's the extension of the spring uh, and the force being applied. As you can see here, it's linear. Okay, if it starts to go like this or bend out, well then it's reached, reached its elastic limit. Okay, so the spring is unstretched. Uh, so we've got the spring like this. When it's hanging, it's at this. So it's got an extension here. And then the block is attached to the lower end. The block hangs at equilibrium at point X. And the spring, zero point... Okay, the block is then pulled, so then we apply some force to this thing. And we pull it, and we extend it even more. And then we release it, and it moves uh, up, right? Because it's got that elastic potential, and then we release it, it's going to spring back up. 
So determine the spring constant. Well, the spring constant is just the gradient of this graph. All right? Because so f equals kx. So k equals f over x. Or just a point on the line because it starts at 0, 0. So you pick any point or find the gradient on the line because it's the same thing. You're going to get the spring constant. So k equals f over x. Let's pick an easy point. Let's just pick the top one, 4. And 4 and 0 0.05. So it's got 4 newtons of force. And it's always important to check. Yeah. So it's in meters. You need things in standard base ISI units. And so here, sometimes they put it in millimeters or centimeters. If they do, you just need to try and, um, transpose it into the correct units. So 4 divided by 0 0.05. So we'll give us our spring constant. How's everyone doing? Anyone stressed? I'm pretty... No, I'm not. I'm fine. Not stressed at all. Yeah, it's 80 newton meters. Alright, newton meters because newtons over meters. So that's the unit. Use the figure to show the decrease in elastic potential energy of the spring is 0 0.055 joules when it moves from y to x. Right? So when it moves from y to x, there's going to be a decrease in its elastic potential, right? The more you pull it out, the more elastic potential it's going to have, the more energy stored. And so if we want to find this, well, this is just the elastic potential is half fx, or the area under this fx graph. And so for this, we need to figure out what the, these two points are. So we have the extension point here. So at this point here, it's extended by 0 0.015, right? From 0 0.08 to 0 0.095. So that'll be 0 0.015 is here. And that's at the point. This is 1.1, 1.2. Okay. And then at point Y, well, from here, it's extended out to 0 0.0, 0 0.04, right? This minus this. To find the extension, because this is the length, not the extension. So to find the extension, we just minus them from each other. That's at 3.2. Okay, so we have the points. So if we want to find this, we need the area. So we want to find the decrease in elastic potential, we're going to need this area here. <laughs> this big area because this is the elastic potential that will be stored when we pull it out so when we you know when it comes back to position x well that's the amount that's going to be lost or decreased okay so this would be well how would we find that you can just do this big triangle minus this big this smaller triangle so this big thing here is just going to be half base the base is 0 0.04 times the height which is 3.2 be half base which is 0 0.04 times height which is 3.2 minus half base here the smaller triangle right minus the big triangle minus the small triangle give us this air will be 0 0.015 times 1.2 0 0.015 times 1.2 okay and this equals 2 3.2 times 0 0.04 divided by 2 Part 0 0.064 minus 0.015 times 1.2 new amount of math tool. So 0 0.064 minus this, not divided by this, minus. Ugh, this is 0. Point. God. Shambles. Zero point zero zero nine zero point zero five five joules. That's what they want. It's just the area under the graph between these two extension points. The block has a mass of 
that calculate the increase in gravitational potential energy. Oh, change in the increase in G, change in. Look at what is what even is that? Man, I need to. M G change in H. What is the change in H? Well, the change in H is going to be the difference between these two points, which is zero point zero two five, right? So the mass zero point one two two times nine point eight one times the change in height is just going to be, you know, the difference between these two points, and that's going to be the increase in gravitational potential energy. Okay, so that's what was it? Zero point zero two five. Times 9.81 times 0.025. So you get 0.0299 and rounded, that would be 0 0.030. Two significant figures. Okay, use the decrease in elastic potential energy and the answer in C and the increase in gravitational energy to determine for the block as it moves through position X its kinetic energy. Okay, so here we're going to need to think about how the en energy is being transformed. Well, we have this thing, it's pulled out, it's not moving, it's being held here. So then all of this energy is being held in uh, the spring itself, in the elastic potential energy. And it's when it's released, the energy is being transformed into speeding the block up and also increasing its gravitational potential energy. So we can say that the Elect, um, not electric, the elastic potential energy is going into, you know, it's, it's kinetic energy and it's um, gravitational energy. These two. Right? So then EK equals to um, EP minus EG. Right? It's being it's pulled out. If you're holding it there, you can let it go. Well, it speed starts speeding up, so it's increasing its kinetic energy and it's also moving up. So that means it's increasing its gravitational potential energy. So all of that energy, which is being lost, or is being transformed into kinetic and uh, gravitational potential energy. So, you know, uh, this is just going to be 0 0.055, the elastic potential energy, minus 0 0.03. No, I'm not using my calculator. 0 0.025 joules. Okay, so that's the kinetic energy. And if you want to find a speed, well, EK equals to a half MV squared. So, you know, if we V squared equals to 2 EK, I'm just rearranging square root. Rearrange for V, well, this is equal to 2 times 0 0.025 divided by the mass, which was... 0.122 2 times 0 0.025 divided by 0 0.122 per root 0 0.64 64 meters per second cool so that shows you that gives you basically all of that stuff all of the theory that we went through and we've got elastic potential energy we've got Hooke's law we got our forces we've got extension the big thing with this question is really the you know units and stuff like that and they also like to mix it in a lot so just go through the worksheet and you'll see okay let's do some stuff on stress and strain in young's modulus so this is another question so define strain well as you'll see seen on the worksheet strain is just uh, um, x over l which is extension over the original length. So a wire is, a d is designed to ensure that the strain does not exceed this amount when this amount, 8,000 newtons, is applied. Uh, the Young's modulus, so they're just giving us a bunch of stuff uh, for this force. Calculate the maximum stress. Oh. What is stress? Great question. <laughs> In physics, stress is, so we have the Young modulus equals to stress over strain, right? We're given the strain, 
and we're given the Young's modulus. So it doesn't exceed this, so therefore the stress will be equal to E times uh, strain. So Young's modulus times strain. Okay, so that means for this maximum, because it doesn't exceed this, so for this maximum uh, strain, and this is at its greatest, well, this will be at its greatest, so this will be at its maximum. Right, they're proportional. So this is 2.1 times 10 to the 11. Times 4 times 10 to the negative 4. I feel like my handwriting is just getting worse all the time. To relax, you know. So this is 8.484 million, basically. 8.4 times 10 to the 7 pascals. Right? Because stress is force of air. So 8.4 times 10 to the 7. Find the minimum cross sectional area. Well, stress equals force over area. Therefore, area <laughs> equals. Uh, force over stress. Okay, so if we want this cross-sectional area for the minimum, or well, this will occur when the stress is at the maximum. As this increases to maximum, this will decrease the minimum. Right? The larger this value is, the smaller the area is going to get. Right? Divide by a huge number, this number is going to get a smaller number for the same amount of force. Right? They're inversely proportional. Okay, this is. It's just 8k which is 8,000 so 8,000 newtons divided by the maximum stress which is 8.4 times 10 to the 7 8,000 divided by answer 9.5 plus <clears throat> 10 to the negative 5 meters squared again it's always important to be checking the units because they're sneaky with the units they want to catch you off. It's cheap tricks, to be honest. But they want to catch you out. And so just make sure you're checking the units. You know, I can see this is in Newtons, this is in Pascal, so we're Gucci. They try and catch you out, especially in this question. But we won't let them. All right, we won't let them. Okay, that's it. Download that worksheet. Hopefully that was good. But the worksheet's a banger. Six, it takes me ages. Download it. I'm getting mad. Download it. Anyway, that's it. And now I'm going to talk uh, about basically materialism. Let's talk. I mean, if you're even watching to the end of these, and you, this, this, these parts are engaging you, you're already clocked in to something. If this is engaging you, you're, you're feeling something here. Let's talk, man. Let's talk about this. Like, what is a solid anyway? Like, what does it mean for something to be material? Physical. We live in a physical world, right? That's what, that's what we're being told. That's, that's, that's the ideas that science is giving us. We have this material world and then consciousness, consciousness or things arise out of it, these secondary phenomenon. You know, what, 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 is, what, is a phys, what, what does it mean for something to be solid anyway? What does that mean? You know? If you think that's a silly question, not that I think you do, if you think it's a silly, I mean, you're, you're literally surrounded by solid material objects. Yeah. I'm assuming for most people, they don't even ask the question, well, what, what is a solid object? What is a material? What is it? What, where do we draw the line, right? Is a thought material? Is, I don't know, an emotion material? Am I a material? You know, am I physical? Am I phys just a physical thing? Is that it? it? Doesn't feel like that. You know, we live in this physical world. Right? We live in this physical world, but yet and we're all guided by, you know, ethereal, immaterial things. You know, we're guided by who we who we you know who we fuck with, who we like, emotion, feeling, um, you know. Looking at myself, if I turn in, you know, that's who is that thing? That's not a material thing. Huh? If something is, it seems like 
the consensus is, okay, there's this material world, and then there's these immaterial things that come out of it. Is that the way to look at it? I don't know. I mean, I'm just like, let's just talk. I'm not, the thing is, I'm not trying to tell you anything. I'm not trying to sit here. This isn't like a lecture part. I'm not just sitting here being like, this is how it is. I don't know. I don't know, but I'm just exploring it. I'm open to it. I'm open to explore all these ideas. I'm open to question everything. I'm open to yarn about everything. You can yarn about whatever you like. But with physics in particular, you know, they, they make some pretty bold statements. You know, we live in a physical world. That's a bold statement. Do we? I don't know. That's a pretty bold statement. I, you know, I've got some queries. <laughs> I have a lot of evidence in my own life to suggest differently that not everything is material and maybe the material world isn't the primary guiding force here. So yeah, I don't want to make it too long because I don't want to make the video too long, but that's it. I'm just having a fat yarn. I'm having a yarn. So yeah, peace out.